Thank you. Thank you all very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from all over the world. I want to mention that today is the feast of one of the great doctors of the church, St. Cyril of Alexandria, who became the patriarch of Alexandria and in the midst of a lot of controversies defended the uh, teaching about Christ and about the Blessed Mother as the Mother of God. Um, I urge you, in fact, to go to our EWTN document library, look him up and download some of his writings. They're, they're, they're still very helpful for us to this day. That's why he's a doctor of the church. And we also are going to have a great show tonight with author and professor Janet E. Smith. Before we get to her, though, we want to welcome EWTN Radio's general manager, newlywed, and happy husband, Mr. Jack Williams, to give us a little bit of a brief EWTN update on what's happening on EWTN Radio. Jack, how you doing? Fabulous, Father Mitch. Fabulous. You know, I'm extremely excited. I mean, I am a newlywed. I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really excited because one of my heroes is on your show tonight. Yes. Uh, Professor Janet Smith is, yes. uh, you know, I told her her con contributions to the church in America are innumerable yes. at this point. And she so eloquently points out the prophecies that Paul VI left us in Humanae Vitae, celebrating the 50th anniversary of that document. Mm -hmm. And that can leave people, when they look at our society today and the degree to which those prophecies have played out, with a little lack of hope. Yeah. And I'm here to offer you and all your viewers a little bit of hope. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've grown up in America, uh, even before there was television, sort of uh, with a companion by our side in the radio. Mm -hmm. And... We can choose what we listen to on the radio, what we watch on TV. And I would encourage everybody who may be waning a little bit in their hope to tune in to EWTN Radio. We've got phenomenal programming all day, every day. We have two phenomenal morning shows, the Sunrise Morning Show to kick things off. We have a morning show out of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. in Morning Glory. We have great news programs. Teresa Tamio, Al Cresta handle the events yeah. of the day. Yeah. We have call-in programs during the, the, the bulk of the day mm -hmm. where people can get good catechesis and they can he learn about the teaching of the faith. Mm -hmm. We've got a great program on at noon Eastern with Jerry and Debbie uh, called Take Two with Jerry Usher, radio, Catholic radio legend, and mm -hmm. Debbie Giorgiani, where they're just kind of talking over the fence in the backyard and, and kicking around what goes on in life from a Catholic perspective. And um, all of these programs can be brought to you by any number of mechanisms. First of all, you can listen at EWTN.com. You can listen on the EWTN app. If you don't have the EWTN app on your smartphone, you need to get that right away because all of our radio streams can be picked up on the EWTN app. We're on all the major streaming platforms. Tune in, iHeartRadio, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Amazon Echo, Roku, uh, just about anywhere you want to go, you're going to find EWTN Radio. And then most importantly, there are over 300 affiliates around the country that have gone out on a limb as lay people and purchased radio stations carrying our programming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you uh, want to find one of those stations in your area, just go to EWTN.com slash radio, and there'll be a map there that'll show you where those stations are located. And if you don't have an AM FM station in your area, then give me a, a little jingle via email and I can talk you through uh, some steps that might help you bring Catholic Radio to your area. And you can reach me at jwilliams at EWTN.com. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. And it's good to have that kind of update because I know I listen to EWTN as I travel around a lot. Um, now, we have to go on to our guest, your Fine. hero, uh, Professor Janet E. Smith. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us.
right, welcome back. Our guest tonight is a philosopher and author. She also used to be a colleague. We were at University of Dallas together some years ago. And she has served multiple terms as a consultant to the Pontifical Council on the Family. She's written many scholarly and popular articles on the Catholic Church's teaching on sexuality, on moral theology, and bioethics. She currently holds the Father Michael McGivney Chair of Life Ethics at Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, Michigan. And she is the author of the book, Self-Gift, Humane Vitae and the Thought of John Paul II. In addition to that, she's also the editor of a new book scheduled to be released in early August, just in time for the 50th anniversary of Humane Vitae, entitled Why Humane Vitae is Still Right. So please welcome Professor Janet E. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to have you here. It's been much too long since you've been on the live show. Mm -hmm. Delighted to have you here. Good to be here. Thanks. How do you like Detroit? Mm, it's getting better. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I've heard. It's getting better. I've heard that Detroit is improving. It's coming up. I, yeah. I, my bus driver this morning was so excited about going to the downtown uh, old train terminal um, because Ford Motors has bought it and are making it into their headquarters. Oh. And he came here when he was two years old. A family of 12 from Arkansas came up to Detroit, and he wants to go back where he came when he was two to be introduced into Detroit. It was very touching. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's going, I, I, I'm glad that it is going along. And the seminary is doing very well. Seminary is just terrific. Yeah. We're not only are we doing men from different dioceses, we have several orders now who are sending their that's men right. to Sacred Heart. And that's, that's a right. great blend. Yes. Um, you know, just a great blend between the, the diocesan, men training for diocesan priesthood and those in orders. They have so much to offer each other. It's, it's good. I asked about that in particular because it's good for folks to hear that there is a lot of good news going on in the seminaries. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is packed, and St. Louis, New Orleans, Denver. A lot of these seminaries are now full, full, full. So there's. Yeah, there's it's, I, I say it's impossible to be a pessimist if you're teaching in a seminary. Yeah. It's yeah. impossible. We're getting such good men, and I think we're doing a good job forming them. So it's a rough world out there. We're sending them into a rough world, but I hope it we is. prepare them well. Well, let's go to the topic at hand, which is the encyclical by Paul VI, his last encyclical. Uh, you kind of got bruised a bit but, yes. by the, the, the publication of Humane Vitae. Uh, it came out just as I was starting in the Society of Jesus 50 years ago. And uh, this is something Jack Williams brought up in his comments, that Pope Paul VI truly had prophetic predictions of the trends he saw. He was, he was not speaking as an uh, Old Testament prophet, but he could see what was logically going to happen if birth control was brought into play. Let's speak about that first. What did he say and how has it panned out yeah, over yeah. the last 50 years? And as you said, it wasn't so much a personal prophecy. This is a prophecy based upon the wisdom of the church. Yep. That, that in, but it took, I mean, the ability to see what where the culture was at the same time. The pill wasn't invented until the late 1950s. Mm -hmm. right? Before that, all there was was... And by the pill, you mean the birth control the pill? The contraceptive pill. Yes. Right? Everybody knows when you say what the pill is. They know yeah. it's not aspirin. Right, no, father, no, no, no. Okay. Just want to make sure. Make sure, sure yeah. <laughs> okay. Nail it down. All right, yeah, the pill was invented in the late 1950s, and um, before that, there was just the condom and some form of the diaphragm. It's a real game changer, and everybody knew it would be. Everybody was afraid that the world was overpopulated and that this was going to control overpopulation. 
women were becoming more and more active in the workplace and people thought, oh, this will permit women to follow careers. There's a couple things going on that made the pill seem just like a lifesaver, right? Well, was, this is the same period, or just about the same year or so, that the population bomb yeah, yeah. was published All right. as a book warning that by the 1980s there'd be 8 billion people <laughs> and um, there'd it be, would be mass starvation. Food. That's right. That's mass right. starvation. Right. And the UN was starting to hold big, big conferences on what to do about overpopulation. And the world saw the, US, the, the Catholic Church as being, you know, sort of the enemy to being able to deal with that problem. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a lot of pressure on the church to change its teaching on contraception. And uh, but Paul VI, through a whole series of, of deliberations, uh, came out with Humanae Vitae against a huge push, not only in the culture, but in the church, that the church should change its teaching on contraception. And the prophecies are, were four, right? Uh, one was that there would be a general decline in morality. Anybody notice that in the last 50 years, right? It's not hard to make that case, all right? Uh, you just look at things like pornography, um, same-sex unions, uh, all of the, I mean, what's on TV now on, would family TV would be pornographic back in the 1960s. Advertisements well, would be considered uh, pornographic. Well, e e and, uh, I, I think uh, as a very profound change, when I was born in the 1940s, the uh, rate of out of wedlock childbirth was 4%. Yeah, right. By 1960, it had gone up to 5%. Today, it's now 52% of all children are born to unmarried parents. 80% in Detroit. Yeah. Unbelievable. There's no tax base, there's nothing in Detroit except single mothers with children, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a rough, rough story. And that's, the, the, the first two prophecies are very, very similar, a general uh, declining in morality, and then a, a sort of a, that men would, would cease, to, cease to have regard for, for women. Mm -hmm. they, they would not care for their, and women would suffer both psychologically and um, physically mm -hmm. uh, from the consequences of contraception. Uh, those are enormous. Uh, it, it, in, we've lived through a time when people finally honestly assessed the effects of uh, cigarettes, of tobacco. Of course, when it was first being promoted, it was always a healthy thing, and we now know that the, the researchers and the sellers of it um, so com completely suppressed the evidence about how bad tobacco was. Oh, it, I it remember was, back on television, medical doctors yeah. were advertising cigarette brands, right. and and with uh, there'd be a beautiful woman, and a middle-aged handsome doctor, uh, smoking and promoting it. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was just normal. Well, they were handed out free on, on on street corners, so that get people would get hooked on them, mm -hmm. and they found out that, of course, in all of the files of the companies, there was all this evidence of, of the connection between. Um, tobacco and cancer, lung cancer. So yeah. it, 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 the same thing will happen with contraception. We've known for some time the connection between contraception and, and strokes and heart attacks and especially some forms of cancer. Not to mention the day by day, what they are considered to be minor side effects, which are depression, all right, weight gain, irritability, and a reduced desire to have sex. And I always say every woman I know wants a pill that will make her more irritable, more prone to depression, to help her gain weight and have less interest in sex. And every man I know wants the woman he's dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> and we have just the thing to help you there, which yeah. is the contraceptive pill. The secular world is more and more catching on. The New York Times has had a series over the last year on different contraceptive um, uh, uh, devices and medications. I shouldn't call them medications, different forms of contraception, and how bad they are for women. There's a book out there called Sweetening the Pill that's written by a, a very secular woman who took the pill for 20 years. And then she decided to look up and see what it did to her body, and she couldn't believe it. She stopped taking it, she says she feels like a totally different person. Mm -hmm. Men and women relate differently when yes. women are using contraceptives. That's exactly right. Men are much more attracted to women when women have fertile cycles, much mm -hmm. more attracted. The, 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 you know, well, some of these people said they're from Kansas, right, earlier? Yes. One time I gave this talk, and I said that there are studies that show that men are 
much more attracted to women in their fertile cycles. And a, a man came up to me and just kidding around, a he says, listen girl, he said, we don't, we don't need studies in Kansas to make us aware of that reality. He said, we know you can put a bull in a pen a mile away from a cow with three fences in between, and if she's fertile, he'll get there, all right? <laughs> So That's, you know that you know I I know enough about farms to yeah. know that bulls are interested in two things: checking out the cow urine to see if they're fertile, and protecting that field from any other bull coming in there. <laughs> That's right. That's so right. Twofold job. So there, in our, that book that you mentioned, why humanity is still right. One of the es essays by a, a lady oncologist who makes the connection between. Um, abortion and breast cancer and contraception. Oh, and, and uh, breast Angela cancer. and Frankie. Angela and Frankie. Yes, she's mm -hmm. she's fantastic, and mm -hmm. she's doing. She's been uh, studying all of these studies that are coming out on the effects of hormones on on women, uh, higher incidence of suicide, greater incidence of of domestic abuse between women who are contracepting and the uh, when women are contracepting and not contracepting, and she says if Paul the Six had had all these studies. Uh, back in 1968, he could have even made a stronger prediction about uh, contraception. Again, the, the church knows these things in its wisdom that if you're going against nature, if you're violating a woman's beautiful ecological system, you can be sure there are going to be bad consequences. We know that God designed the body well. And the uh, contraceptives are basically steroids. Angela and Franke actually That's has right. a, has a um, pamphlet that says, you don't give boys steroids, why do you give them to girls? It's a great question. And one of the other, you, you mentioned the, the environment of a girl's body. The, the contraceptive pill is also having a serious impact on the water table right. because the, it, the, the way that it's bonded, that the steroids are bonded to the uh, chemicals, they go into the water system and it's affecting uh, fish and the ratios of females to males among fish and amphibians. Uh, not to mention, we don't know the effects of how that is on the drinking water uh, and what it does for humans and other animals. Yeah, I, so it, it's, I see a, you've, done, you've done your homework, and it's, that's, ex that's yes, exactly ma Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, but you're exactly right, and I challenge anybody to just Google, you know, contraceptives, estrogen, the environment, and fish. And they will come up with studies all over the world. And one of my favorite ones is in Boulder, Colorado, because I once gave a talk there to a very liberal audience, all right, as you would expect in Boulder, Colorado. Sure. I, kept, I kept referring to them as my green friends. You know, mm -hmm. the title of my talk is Why Green Sex is Best, all mm -hmm. right? Sex without chemicals, all right? Sex without contraceptives, or even condoms, which are made out of plastics, et cetera, that uh, are bad for the environment. That's right. But they have a study that shows that um, upstream from a sewage plant uh, on the Boulder River, I think it's the Boulder River, um, there's like 50, almost 50-50 male-female in the fish ratio. Mm -hmm. But fish can change their gender by mm -hmm. the influence of hormones. And there's so many hormones in the chemical contraceptives of, of estrogen hormones. Those are the ones that are uh, harmful, that, that turn males into females, basically. Mm -hmm. Downstream from the sewage plant, where the sewage is being dumped into the river, um, there's 80 males and 20 females per 100 fish. So it was 50-50 and now it's like 80-20. There might be a few ambiguous gender fishes in, in that collection. Sure. But, so the, the other thing too that I saw in um, a, a publication by Dr. Richard Wetzel called mm -hmm. Sexual Wisdom. Yes. Uh, great book. Great book. Um, uh, just bringing medical science and making it understandable to the, the lay reader. Um, he did a, a, a chart showing the sales of uh, the contraceptive pill and condoms from 71 or so until the 90s. And it's a very high, steep increase. Right. But then he overlaid on that from the uh, Center for Disease Control that the rate of abortion increase followed the same curve. And the rate of out of wedlock birth followed the same curve. And the increase of sexually transmitted diseases followed the same curve. And? 
the and the rate of divorce and rate of divorce. Well, he didn't have that, that but it but it can it, be but done. But that's also there. Yes. But the, these measurable scientific uh, issues uh, and physical issues were, as he said, were counterintuitive. You would think the more of the contraceptives there were, the less out of wedlock birth, abortion, and STDs there'd be. And it's the opposite. It's the opposite. And his conclusion was when people believe that this is so-called safe sex, that they then take more risks, yeah. and as a re and the, that doesn't work out for right. them. Right. The the risks fail because the contraceptives also have yeah, failure well, rates. I use all those that data in my in the presentations I do in my talk on contraception. Why not? And there's always some smart aleck little sophomore in the audience, you know, that says, "My teacher says that all you've proved is correlation and not causation." Mm -hmm. And I said, that's honestly, in a post-Humian world, that's all anybody ever proves because the world doesn't really believe in causation because it doesn't believe in natures or forms or essences and that sort of thing. So we've certainly proven a causation, overwhelmingly a correlation. We, you know, that these things, co they come along together, as you said. You say, they, but you haven't proven causation. And I said, well, first of all, do you believe in causation? Because I'm not going to bother talking to you unless you do believe in it. But if we know the nature of sex and we know the nature of human beings, that's how the church made these predictions that these things would happen. Because it, and, and, and the predictive power of science always counts as one of its major indicators of some, a theory being true is that it has predictive power. And as you said, Pope Paul VI predicted all those things. And once we explain to people the nature of sex and the nature of the human person, then it's no surprise that these, these things happen, as you said. I mean, people want to have sex, and they want to have sex without consequences. Contraception allows them to do that. But then the consequences happen anyway because sex leads to babies. I mean, that's one of the most amazing things when I'm speaking out there is, you know, I say that one time people thought that having sex, being in love, and being prepared for children and being married were all connected. You shouldn't have sex unless you're in love. You shouldn't have sex unless you're prepared for babies. And you're not prepared for babies until you're married. But now our culture thinks that having sex and having babies are two entirely different things. In fact, they're surprised when they get pregnant. They talk about an accidental pregnancy. And you want to say, I was telling people, you can't get pregnant by accident, right? We yeah. know the cause and we know the effect. But all these, all these movies have women taking pregnancy tests. They go, oh, I'm pregnant. They <laughs> say, are you, why are you so surprised? I want to say, you were having sex, weren't you? Yeah. You know, they're sort of like, well, what does that have to do with it? And so people are now having sex with people they don't know their last names, they don't care beans about. And so when you talk about abortion being a consequence of contraceptive sex, and people say, well, get people more and better contraceptives. I said, the more and better you give them, the more abortions there are there are, because, and it's not the contraception failure that's the problem, it's the relationship failure. Mm -hmm. Men and women are, women are having sex who don't intend to have a baby. Now if they loved each other and were prepared for babies, if they got pregnant, that would, be, that would work, and especially if they were married, mm -hmm. right? It may be inconvenient, but you still have a context in which that child can be welcomed. And my general instinct is that most of the people who have ever walked this planet were not planned. <laughs> I doubt it. That's right. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the, may some were, but not most. And so, this is ex this is human existence, and you have to set the the environment. Now we're going back to environment. The environment of, you know, accepting the my spouse as a spouse I'm committed to, because we have to be committed to these kids. They're gonna be around for 18 years, and even after that, they keep coming back, they keep and they coming. bring more with them. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you have to be prepared for long-term commitment, because they're not finished, even when they're 18. They're not done yet. There's a lot of growth that goes on, and you're blessed to have adult children that you raise and meet the grandkids right. and all that. So this is a long, a lifelong commitment. Well, that's uh, and that's the yeah, best good. context for all this. Well, yeah, but, uh, there's two more predictions we need to get to, but I want to talk to that point because it's so important. 
um, to ask to sort of ask people why is it that the sexual act is the act that consummates a marriage, right? Why why does this act the act that says this is a forever union, mm -hmm. all right? Well, it's just for the reason you said that when you have a child with another person, you have a forever union with that person, all right? You will always have a relationship with that person. Whether you're married or unmarried, if you had a child with this person, you have a lifelong joint relationship, all right? Even if you get a divorce. Exactly. All you're going to do is have two houses from which you argue, but you will still be <laughs> arguing about the kids, the money, and everything right. else. But the, the act of sexual intercourse that John Paul II says, it has, there's a language to it. There's a language of the body. And this act, because it's procreative in its very orientation, says, I'm willing to be a parent with you, which means I'm willing to commit my whole life to a relationship with you. And so the very, that act is the perfect act that God <laughs> put in place as the act that makes a marriage consummated, f full. It's, uh, before that, you have a ratified, but not yet a consummated marriage until you've had the act of sexual intercourse. And with it, that act is supposed to be with you and you only, you and you exclusively forever. And this is open to children, meaning with my body, I'm telling you, I'm willing to be in a lifetime relationship with you. Whereas with contraception, say, okay, I'll give you part of myself, but I'm going to keep part of this not working so that you don't get all of who I am. You can't possibly speak this life, lifetime giving in that because you've taken that meaning out. Yeah. You've thwarted it. You've said, I don't want the baby making meaning in this act. Mm -hmm. In which case it becomes a momentary act. It doesn't, it can't speak future. It can only speak now, yeah. all right? So this is why young people think there's nothing wrong with having sex outside of marriage because there's no commitment. And the sexual act, contraceptive act is a non non-committal act but they've completely diminished the meaning of the sexual act. That yeah. Now, you said there was a couple other things that the Pope also predicted. Yeah. There were two more predictions. Yeah, One well, is that um, governments would start to use contraception in, in oppressive ways. Mm -hmm. And the example I used for years was, um, you know, mandatory abortions in uh, China yeah. and forced sterilizations. Now, our own government with the HHS mandate is a perfect example. I mean, the government is for, was forcing the poor sisters of St. Clair to pay for contraceptives. Right. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. But it, somehow it's become so much a fabric of our, the part of the fabric of our culture that we have to provide free contraceptives to people. And then the last one? The last one is we start to treat our bodies like machines. Ah, right? yeah, for sure. And certainly IVF is a perfect example of that. In the, vitro the, fertilization. In vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. But now, John Paul, nobody, Pope Paul VI, nobody, until maybe at most 10 years ago, I don't think, any, it must have been five years ago, that anybody thought transgenderism would be a major topic and concern, where people are now choosing what sex they want to be, all right? And so it's, we now think our bodies, you know, once you start tampering, you, what, I mean, in a certain sense, what is contraception? Contraception is denying your femininity or your masculinity. You're saying, I want to have sex in a way in which my, my reproductive powers, which are at the very root of our sexual identity, we want to deny that, and we just want to become sort of neutered. I mean, honestly, well, they are, they are that's what, what it is. Yeah, all right? Transgender people are neutered. Well, and so are those who are using contraception to some extent. All right? It's temporary, but it's still, that's in fact what it is. And so you want to say, if you can do it with contraception, why can't you do it in a much thorough, more a programmatic way than just stopping your sexual acts, just change your whole biology, if, which you can't, of course. Born that's, a male, you'll always be a male. Born a female, you'll always be a female. That's right. Can't change the DNA one bit. Not one bit. We have to take a break, you know, but it's, it's good for us to see this perspective. Mm -hmm. And now after, fi it's only 50 years. That's not that long a uh, time, you know, I mean, I consider the modern age starting around 200 A.D., so 50 years is nothing. <laughs> so uh, I have a long perspective. Uh, Calcolithic period, love yes. it. But we're, we're going to uh, encourage you to get Professor Smith's book, Self-Gift, Essays on Humanae Vitae and the Thought of John Paul II. It's going to be available at EWTNRC.com, and it'll be book item 2708.
But we'll be back in a couple of minutes. I want to get your questions and comments, as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us. Right to your questions. Let's start off with Anastasia. Anastasia, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing just fine, Father. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. And your question? Well, I have a, a young teenage girl that I was talking with. She's taking the pill for un irregular or heavy cycles. Uh, and from what the guest said, you know, I know they cause depression and other things. And this girl actually has been struggling with depression, and also mm -hmm. even confided in me that she had even contemplated suicide. Mm -hmm. So my primary question is, is there a viable uh, alternative to the pill for issues of cycles uh, and things like that? I know NAPRO has some, some things that they work with as far as product, reproduction, sure. but is there any way they can get a hold of information that would give them a safer alternative for that? Thank you, ma'am. So... Oh, yes. I, the Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. I think she mentioned NAPRO technology. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I heard that. but Yes. Yes. Well, um, Dr. Tom Hilgers knows as much about a woman's fertility cycle as almost anybody on the face of the earth. And uh, unfortunately, most doctors prescribe contraceptives to any teenage girl because he thinks she's going to be sexually active. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of pathetic how little doctors actually know about it a woman's fertility cycle. Mm -hmm. If she's having so many problems, either of excessive bleeding or irregular cycles, there's something wrong with her hormones. Now there's many natural ways to treat hormones and that's, that's what um, Hilgers will be working at. Even if you need hormones, he has a way of helping women, providing women with things that will produce the natural, naturally produce and supplement the hormones that she needs. So right. his website has uh, a directory of people trained by him and if you can't find someone trained by you, him in your vicinity, he can do a lot long distance just by sending different blood tests, et cetera, to him. All right, now, and what's the, the site that they can go to? It's the to? Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. So look up Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska, and find out more about it there. And they have resources that can consult, uh, medical resources that can exactly. consult. Exactly. It's, it's a very medically fine-tuned uh, approach to fertility and woman's hormonal cycle. Good. Sir, where are you from? Birmingham. <laughs> Good to have you here. And your question? So my question is, <clears throat> um, so I think I, I know firmly that contraception is wrong because it takes away from the procreative act or right. aspect from the marital act. So. Why is natural family planning? Doesn't it take away from the procreative aspect as well from the marital act? So why would that be considered morally? Great question. Okay. Great question. So why is natural family planning uh, a more ethical right. alternative to the contraceptive yeah. pill? It's the it's ethical one. The question. others are unethical. Um, well, I could give an hour on that, but I'll try to be selective, all right? Because um, well, you don't have that. I don't have an hour. I mean, it's understandable that the question is asked. You can have two couples who both have probably, possibly very legitimate reasons for wanting to uh, limit their family size, maybe three kids under five, exhausted, et cetera. One uses contraception, one uses NFP, all right? Are they doing the same thing? We both want to have sex without having babies, all right? Mm -hmm. So it seems it's identical. 
but the church has always taught, and we all know, that it makes a huge difference what kind of means you use That's in right. order to achieve an end. Two men could want to support their family, one gets a job, one robs a bank, all right? So what's illegitimate, what's immoral about contraception? We've talked a lot about what's yes. immoral about it. I can talk another couple hours about that. Mm -hmm. But natural family planning is absolutely respecting a woman's fertility, all right? God has made a woman's cycle so that there's times in the cycle where she's fertile and times when she's infertile. And he's given us the intelligence to figure that out, mm -hmm. right? So God has basically said, I mean, he's designed a sex to have infertile periods and have fertile periods. We haven't done that, he did that. And he tells married couples, you're allowed to have sex all month long, whether you're fertile or infertile, right? So you're saying, why are they not having sex They're, during, the inf during the fertile times? Because they, we hope, prayerfully consulted with God that this is, it's not a good time for them not to have another child right now. So God is saying, well, then don't have sex during the fertile time if it's not a good idea to have another child. When the couple could say it to God, well, can we not have sex during the other times? And he said, why not? I mean, I said you could have sex all, all month long. Just because you're not having it this time doesn't mean you can't have it mm. at this time. So that makes, a, that makes a difference? It makes a huge difference. And if you talk to people, mm -hmm. they will say, if you say to them, there's no difference between contraception and NFP, and then you say to them, well, why don't you use NFP? And they'll go, that would be entirely different. And they just told me it wasn't different. And you say, well, what, how is it entirely different? And they go, contraception, I can have sex on my terms. With natural family planning, I have to correspond myself to some objective reality. I have Maybe to exercise the woman's the, the, natural yes, cycle. uh, cycles. I have to exercise self-discipline. I have to be controlled. Also, you know, one of the things that uh, married couples have told me frequently is that by using natural family planning, they end up talking more about sexuality. It's not mechanized, but it becomes a more intimate part of their conversation and relationship. Yeah. And it actually builds up a respect by the man for the woman and her own natural cycles, but for you know respecting her uh, increases. And he also finds a lot of respect there that they, uh, uh, couples I know have made the transition uh, really, really say they'll never go back to artificial uh, contraception. That is generally the case. Um, I mean, it does. Uh, uh, just statistics on divorce. I mean, at most we can, I mean, the statistics seem to show that only about 2% of couples using NFP ever divorce. Right. right now, obviously, it's not just NFP. There's something that NFP produces in a marriage. Right. The, as you said, the communication, the, and, and again, honoring God, honoring the way that God has made uh, nature, mm -hmm. and that God wants couples to stay together. So those who are following his will are going to be, of course, getting many more graces to overcome many of the difficulties. And NFP is difficult, just like, just like dieting, just like budgeting, just like exercising regularly, just like a very constant good prayer life. Those are all hard, all right? And people, but some people say, it's so hard we shouldn't have to do it. I said, well, everything that's good is hard. Yeah. All right, and so, but what, look at the benefits. Now, some people say that they, the, the benefits haven't come for them, or at least not as quickly as they like. Then I often ask, I, hate, I don't want you know probe too much, but those who have had sex before marriage and contraceptive before marriage can have a very hard time with natural family planning. Again, because sex has become some, their chief way of communicating, their chief way of showing their love it, it, and on demand, all right? Whereas couples who have not had sex before marriage have really had to exercise quite enormous self-control, especially in our culture where there's no, no, no uh, opera, yes, there's no, uh, there's no yeah. disapproval of people having sex before marriage. So when they go into marriage and decide they want to start using NFP, they, they were abstaining for a couple years before they got married. And abstention for them isn't like this huge lack. It's like we were in love, wildly in love with each other before we got married. We knew how to have fun with each other. We know how to be affectionate without it leading to sex. So NFP is, is, is not that difficult. But for those who have contracepted, it usually takes them a year and a half to three years yeah. to start to appreciate the discipline that comes with NFP. And, and when they do that kind of family planning, they have to think very carefully about some of the reasons. 
are they saying, well, we're not going to have kids now because I really, really got to have a Lexus, you know, that, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, the, the, right. my, the, it, the, you have to have a, 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 also a good sense, a, a grave understanding of why you want to wait well, for the heavenly it, children. It, as you say, the and the one of the things that's important about that communication, as you're just indicating, is a communication about values. Yes. You know, why aren't we having, couples want to have sex absolutely understandably. So they don't like the abstinence. Who does? So if time comes for abstinence, and it, this was like a vacation or something, you say, why? You know, they ask the question, why did we decide it wasn't a good idea to have children? And as you surface the answers to that, you discover all sorts of things about the relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a good reason, if it's a good reason, it's not hard to abstain, right? If you say, you know, if we have another child right now, X will happen. And it's, it, it's such a, a kind of not good thing for this marriage to say, well, that is diminishing our sexual desire right now. Let's go watch TV. Let's go for a walk. You know, if you've got a good reason, if you don't have a good reason, it's like, well, let's go ahead and have sex, which is wonderful, yeah. all right? But you've, you've made the decision in, in reference to what is the mission of your life? What is the direction and the values of your life? Another question from our audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Iola, Kansas. Good to have you. And your question? Yeah, um, I've observed in teaching, and I was a teacher, that when a couple begins to have sex, they have the, uh, their relationship stunts at that point. Whereas in marriage, because of the unity of effect, they begin to develop. How do you get that? through to young people today? Well, uh, as, John, as Pope Francis has said, the church is a field hospital. And believe me, people are walking around wounded sexually and in their hearts. They have been used, all right? They've been in these relationships that they were, thought were going to be wonderful, and I found the love of my life. And then all of a sudden, she's gone or he's gone. And you say, what happened here, all right? Whereas, you know, we talk about safe spaces, <laughs> I say, Marriage is a safe space, all right? Marriage is the safe space for sex, all right? And um, it's where you know that if in many ways you fail or disappoint, the other person's made a pledge for a lifetime relationship, and you have too. So you work things out. You don't want to live 50 years in a miserable relationship. So if something's difficult, you say, let's, let's work it out. And I trust you, and I trust me, because we've made this pledge, and we want it to work, and let's just keep working at it. But before marriage, with no vows, no commitment, something goes wrong, someone's out the door. And so I think that's, um, that's <coughs> the woundedness. And if we can reach people and say, I, I mean, have, been, have you been happy with how these relationships have gone? Are you happy the way they ended? Wouldn't you like to have a lifetime committed relationship with someone who has made a lifetime commitment to you and to working things out? Wouldn't you like that? <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, I think I can do it this way. Say, so, okay, just keep trying. But the church, again, has the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And um, the, the fact is, again, that couples who live by the church's teaching, not having sex before marriage, not using contraception within marriage, have a phenomenal um, long-lasting marriage rate. Yeah, and in, in, I've also, suggested to young people to respond to your question before marriage. This is a privileged time when you're engaged. Mm -hmm. You need to know that later on in marriage, there will be times where you cannot be intimate. Mm -hmm. Sickness and travel, right. military deployment, all sorts of circumstances occur in marriage. And this is the period in which you can learn whether you're, you and your partner can wait and be faithful to mm -hmm. each other when sexual, sexual intimacy is not possible. And if you can do it in, before marriage, you have a school for learning that you can trust each other during marriage. Right. This, and you don't get that chance again. Yeah, right. So this is a very important element of that chastity before marriage. And another hook I have, it's very important to ask that how you, how you do speak to young people about this. I, have, I can infallibly say that young people hate divorce. Right? They hate it. 
they they do not many have grown i mean 50 percent or so have grown up in households that are divorced mm -hmm. and the misery of that different place every weekend mom and dad are fighting with each other um stepmother stepchildren stepfather all the confusion not being home for the prom because you're with your dad or your mother or whatever it's it's horrible and they all know that either they've experienced themselves or they see it with their friends yep. right they all know it and i say you know if you live by the church's teaching on sexuality that's the best guarantee for, for avoiding that. It's the best guarantee. And all of a sudden they're saying, oh, well that is something I want. I yeah. do want a long lasting marriage. I don't want to go through a divorce. I don't want to put my children through divorce. And through all these tenuous relationships. Right. You have another question from our studio. Sir, where are you from? Uh, San Antonio, Texas. God bless you. And what is, <laughs> What is your question? Uh, well, well, thank you. The, uh, the question I had is it brought us some intriguing uh, uh, questions regarding the, uh, the impact of contraception, how it, it limits or uh, inhibits our full expression of our masculinity or femininity, as may be the case. And then you brought up transgenderism being a radical uh, change in that very, in, in its nature. Do you have any idea or can you shed some light on what you think might uh, happen if, uh, if that were to be mainstream or to, to really take hold? I honestly think it's just about happened, uh, very surprisingly, in, in just a couple years. I mean, who doesn't know about transgenderism now? We now have bathrooms that are, are open to transgendered men or women, uh, and we have men, uh, f biological males, which are all males are biological males, are competing on women's sports teams. They're winning medals and winning um, track meets at high schools. It's, it, it's, it, it really is insane. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, one of my hashtags on Facebook is, have we hit bottom yet? You know, and I, I just keep wondering where bottom is, but I think bottom might be when you allow a five-year-old to, to decide his sex, all right, for the rest of his life. Um, to put him on, you know, uh, uh, hormones and puberty blockers and even do major surgery. Have we hit bottom yet? I mean, I, I believe there's going to be some movement still for actually cloning uh, boys and girls to be sexual toys. I, why not? Where, mm -hmm. where wouldn't we go in our culture, all right? So that's, I can't think. My, well, my, my mind's not my, sick enough, honestly, yeah. to know where we're gonna go with this. In, uh, in, in one part of the, certainly a, a bottom area, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, given the, the, the sexual immorality throughout the culture, the the resurgence of slavery mm. on a whole new level. Yeah. It was 12 million Africans were brought to the Americas as slaves between 1600 and 1820 mm. or so. But today, there are over there are a, somewhere between 40 and 45 million slaves who, instead of working in the cotton fields, are working between cotton sheets mm -hmm. in brothels around the world. Now this is, this is a, 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 it's, it's an incredible low of the yeah. enslavement of women and children primarily, boys and girls and women, not so much men it seems. And this is absolutely horrific. Uh, it still may get worse, it may get worse. But that's also a big part of the low. I have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm Wichita, Kansas. Great. Good to have you here. And your Thank question? You. My question involves the children. Um, a five-year-old hears in school that somebody is transgender. A 10-year-old talks about being gay. So they come home and they tell their parents, I think I'm a boy when it's a girl, or I think I'm gay, and they're only nine, 10 years old. When does a Catholic parent know that this is just something to explain to them, or when they need to take them to a psychologist or something of that nature? Well, I think you have to get yourself to a, a, a sane, good Catholic therapist, all right? Because either it's just a, a passing fad, it's, and, and more and more that's gonna be true in our culture. Put, we're putting ideas into kids' heads that we never ever would have thought of. And now I think the kid who might be craving attention, uh, et cetera, might say these words, because they'll know he'll get, they'll, everything will go into turmoil and he'll be or she'll be 
the center of attention, anywhere from a small child well into the teens. Um, if a kid in the teenager is feeling alienated and I'm not feeling like I'm fitting in, well, maybe the reason I'm not fitting in is because I'm really another gender than, than what, I, what I was born. Um, so I think the first thing is to try to do a bit of an analysis, whether yeah. it's um, just kind of a passing, trendy plea for attention, some confusion, all right, or where it really is this deep-seated gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. all right, which is, you know, it really is a mental disorder, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, it, there should be no hesitation to say that. The psychiatric, psychological community has said that for, for decades and decades and decades, and now it's just a politically correct thing to say that it's not. And I, I suspect most people have heard, but it's always worth pointing out, is that there's, there's this group of people who um, think that they should be, um, they should be without a limb, all right? They should be someone who only has one arm or one leg, right? How, they, have a healthy, they have healthy arms, healthy legs. And they go to their doctors and they say, I, I've always felt like I was a person that was only a one-armed person, right? And they actually do psychological tests of these people. And supposedly they come out healthy, which I suppose means they pay their bills on time and show up to work on time. But I would know, I, I mean, I'm not trained, but somehow I, I'm not uncomfortable saying that if someone showed up to me and said, I've got this healthy limb, will you amputate it for me? I would say, time for our a, a long-term psychological, you know, care for this poor person, you know, and what is it? I mean, there's all sorts of sexual fetishes, all sorts of possible desires to be in a subgroup that is very kind of admired for their heroism, to live without a limb, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they, they have all sorts of ideas. Um, but the, the sexual dysphoria, gender dysphoria, is, an, is another thing that we've known for a long time is some kind of disorder. And so you have to get the, ch the child to someone who can help them uh, with this. Yeah, and I, I think that's going to be key, to learn to listen to what, what is it you're uncomfortable with? Why is that? Let's talk that through and listen carefully and understand, because it might be a variety of things beyond just that. Uh, I wish we had more time with that, but we've run Good out. Uh, it is. Uh, again, you can pre-order uh, the book Why Humanae Vitae is still right by going to EWTNRC.com. And I want to thank you very much for being with us. And I want to bless all of you. May God bless you and keep you and strengthen you and your families, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this show and all the other programs only because the network is brought to you by you. You make it possible by your donations between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Help us out. Thank you.